Your essential guide to the world's premier film festival, first on BBC One, as Barry Norman joins the Glitterati in Cannes. little seaside town on the Côte d'Azur. A place of elegant shops and smart hotels. A place where the rich come to moor their yachts before pottering about in the Mediterranean. But every year, for two weeks in May, it's turned into a minor bedlam by the influx of thousands of alien visitors. And such visitors they are. Prancing, preening movie stars with their flinty-eyed retinues, intrusive journalists, prying TV cameras, wheelers, dealers, movers, shakers, and all here because of the annual Festival du Film. They fill the bars and restaurants and poolside tables, and when the sun goes down, they take over the nightclubs and discotheques as well. But they're not just here on pleasure bent, but most importantly, they all have something to buy or sell. Meanwhile, the resident populace of Cannes, for the most part elderly, stands aside in bemusement and pursues its time-honoured hobby of watching its dogs foul the pavements, perhaps reflecting that right now, not all the mayor of is on the streets, much of it's on the cinema screens as well, in Cannes, the Maytime city of the movies. The festival was opened by Mike Nichols' primary colours, in which John Travolta and Emma Thompson play a political couple, not entirely unlike Bill and Hillary Clinton. It was shown, of course, out of competition, which is a very shrewd move. To open the festival and be out of competition means that you get all the hype and attention, plus the glitzy premiere and the regal march up the red-carpeted staircase, without facing the potential humiliation of being pipped for the prizes by some 19-year-old's experimental movie from Outer Mongolia. It's about as close as you can get to a no-lose situation. So how was it last night, John, the, the big opening, opening of the, of the festival? Well, Went it, well? It was, it was grand, as far as I was concerned. Um, I had my beautiful wife with me, and we walked up the uh, red carpet staircase, and uh, the crowds were ex excited, and the movie uh, went over tremendously. And oh. I had uh, these people like uh, Martin Scorsese there, and Isabel Hooper, and... Uh, Any old riffraff, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Sigourney Weaver, and, and their reactions to yeah. it were amazing. Marty thought it was amazing, and, uh, you know, believe it or not, those are the reactions that you kind of wait for of and hope for, because they're your peers, and they're the people you admire the most, yeah. so... Did you do a deliberate impersonation of Bill Clinton? I mean, how close did you want to be to Bill Clinton, because you sounded like him, you looked like him, but not I, too much. I wanted enough that you were captivated by it, and um, the writing uh, sent me off in different directions because it was a composite type of character, but I wanted it enough like uh, Clinton that you would be interested in watching, and it made it contemporary and kind of, but I, I felt it was Carter-esque and uh, Reagan-esque and uh, and even Kennedy asking a, a little bit, try to make a composite, but it mostly remi will remind you of Clinton. Yeah, because the uh, voice was very good. Yes, the voice uh, placement was uh, yeah. his. I'm going to do something really outrageous. I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking he must really be desperate to do that, but if you had to swallow enough sh garbage, you can say it, we're X-rated. Uh, yeah, it, it, me too, if you believe what you read in the paper. <laughs> the other thing that comes across very well in the film is, is the, the media intrusion into, into the lives of, of celebrities. Well, you, you'd have a lot of sympathy with the attitude that this is not oh, necessarily sure. a good thing, wouldn't you? Yeah, they, they, I think all celebrities share lack of privacy. I think that's, that's true. You know, and uh, I think actually, and we deserve privacy. Uh, it's just that it's a, a mixed bag as far as interpretation. Most people think that may agree or may not agree with that mm. idea, but I, I think it's, I think we're worthy of some privacy. Bathroom habits, I think, <laughs> should be private. Sex habits should be private. Um, oh, here, here. <laughs> I will go as far as to say you can know what I eat. It's fine. <laughs> but after that, I think there is a, a line one has to draw. Uh, going back, going back to the film, um, Emma Thompson and 
and young Adrian Lester. I mean, two English actors playing yes. very American characters. I mean, that that, that was that was strange, ca odd casting. It was right on though, because these actors are so good, Emma and Adrian, uh, that they they nailed the uh, American persona really well, and they nailed the the the, the verbiage and the vocal quality and accent. I mean, I mean, you don't. I don't think the casting could have been better. And believe me, they went through some heavy uh, concepts yeah. on casting, and uh, I don't think it could have been better. You know, but look at uh, English actors are, you know, really still the the top of the heap. It couldn't always have been the way it is now. It must have been very different when my grandfather was alive. Well, hey, you were there. You had Kennedy. I didn't. I've never heard a president use words like destiny and sacrifice without thinking. Oh, and, okay, maybe it was bull with Kennedy, too, but, but people believed it. And I guess that's what I want. I want to believe it. The festival regulars are a bit miffed this year. Usually there's at least one controversial movie, such as Crash, about which they can get all steamed up, but not this time. The closest approximation is Terry Gilliam's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which tells of the drug-ridden odyssey of a pair of permanently wasted acid heads. Fear and Loathing in Cannes, then? No, not really. Maybe a bit of loathing demonstrated by those who ostentatiously walked out of the screenings. But the only thing that arouses fear in Cannes is the thought of being left off the invitation list for the late-night parties. But what also strikes trepidation in festival visitors is the prospect of blisters, because what you do here is walk. From film to reception to interview to film, you walk. So what you need most of all is a stout pair of comfortable shoes, though occasionally you do require something a bit quicker than mere feet. Taxi! It's always the same, you can never get a cab when you want one. Taxi! Oh, thank God. Hotel du Cap, please, quick as you can, and please don't say I'm just on my way home, gov. Not often you find a London cabbie prepared to go this far south of the river. Must have been my lucky day. While most of the action takes place in Cannes itself, a kind of parallel film festival is being held up here in the overpriced opulence of the Hotel du Cap at Cap d'Antibes. If you want to talk to the likes of Mike Nichols, John Travolta, Bruce Willis, Hugh Grant, Benicio del Toro, or Terry Gilliam, it's no good looking for them among the hoi polloi in the streets, because though they are in the festival, they are very grandly not of it, and choose to hold court here with Olympian detachment in this multi-millionaire's playground where you need a second mortgage to buy a cup of coffee. Just a bit of one-upmanship, really, but nice work if you can get it, I suppose. Here we are at Cannes. You're in competition first time. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing poncing around up here at the Hotel du Cap when you should be down with the real people in the streets? Well, I wanted to be down there with them. I wanted to put, put my... You uh, didn't. My stars. Yeah. My stars wanted star treatment, and I had to be up here and drag you up. But you're, you're pleased. You've got to come up here. Had I been down there, we would have been doing this in the filth and the heat and the clamor of Cannes. Here we're in a relaxed, calm, reasonable place. So it's very hard to ask you how you react to Cannes since you, you're not there. I mean, you're, you're up here. But I mean, no, I was there yesterday. To be honest, were we were in the yeah. thick of it. I mean, we were in the thick you of it, and it was madness. It was if people think our film is frenzied and bizarre and unbelievable, Cannes is twice as uh, as bad as that. I find, I find it was actually I was exhausted yesterday. I could barely stand up because the frenzy of it is there, and the intensity. And we walk up the stairs, the screaming mobs, and I don't even know what they're screaming. I don't even know if they know what they're screaming at anymore. It's just. This thing is whipped up, and it's, I don't think it exists. I think it's all been an illusion. <laughs> I was pouring sweat. My blood is too thick for Nevada. I've never been able to properly explain myself in this climate. Okay. Be quiet. Be calm. Name? Frank. And press affiliation. Nothing else. Ignore this terrible drug. You said yourself 
I think, that you, you regarded it as a cinematic enema for the 90s. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> do we need an enema? Oh, I think we do. I mean, it, it, in many ways, it's a great reaction against the formula films that we, that's what we see now. These are the big successes. They're the ones that the, the, the machinery just turns out. They're not bad films, some of them are very good films, but they're the same films. There's a, there's a rhythm when you go to see a film now. I know where it's going to go, I know what's going to happen to him, I know that next thing is going to happen, and I wanted to try something that would shake that up. Because I actually, I think it's a very intelligent film, but you've got to get on the right track before you get derailed on this thing. And you've got to be able to move fast from one direction to another, because it's, 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 it's not an easy ride. I want you to understand that this man at the wheel is my attorney. He's not just some dingbat I found on the strip, man. He's a foreigner. I think he's probably Samoan. It doesn't matter, though, does it? Are you prejudiced? Hell no. <laughs> I didn't think so. Because in spite of his race, this man is extremely valuable to me. I forgot about the beer. You want some? Oh. How about some ether? One of the favorites among the 23 films in competition was John Borman's The General, the story of Martin Carhill, a notorious Dublin criminal. Borman is a veteran of Cannes, hence his comparative calm. Is it, is it a good feeling to be in competition here? Uh, well, it, it gets things going, doesn't it? It makes people uh, excited and they can, you know, they can uh, speculate and all that. But it's, uh, you know, competition, it's like the Oscars. It's, uh, it, there's an artificiality about it, you know, but uh, it, it um, creates a bit of excitement, I suppose. What was the opening night like, the premiere? Well, it, you know, there's nothing quite like that. You're going up that red carpet and all the fanfares and then uh, and the, that vast screen, you know, probably the biggest in the world and whatever it holds, 3,000 people. Um, there's, there's something extraordinary about that. And uh, it, was a, yeah, it was a wonderful reception. This Martin Carhill's a remarkable figure. He's a kind of folk hero, isn't he, in parts of Ireland? Absolute legend, yeah, because um, he defied not only the police, but the whole of society, really, for many years. Uh, and, and, and in the end, you, you saw in the film, they had 90 police watching him night and day, trying to entrap him, and, and failed to do so. So, although he was, you know, capable of brutal violence, and uh, he, he, was, he was funny and, and witty and uh, outrageous, uh, and, and really got all his pleasure from making fools of the police, and that, I think, you know, in a country which is, um, I suppose, admires the rebel, um, he became a hero despite his, uh, all his wrongdoings. How would anyone get the kind of money that I buy all this? I'll do Salford Bite. There's a hole in South Africa, full of diamonds. Pays blackies about two pound a week to dig them out for. Seen it on the telly. She has them x-rayed as they clock out in case they swallow you Thankfully, it was What's she writing? It's got to be a love letter. It's a shopping list. She's sending your woman out to the shop for a package of cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan, was, um, is Martin Carhill a, a folk hero to you? Or did you know much about him before the film started? Oh, well, everybody in Dublin knew something about him. Um, it, the newest legend. Uh, he... he he stood on a curbside in 1987 and spoke for about an hour and a quarter to a reporter who, who buttonholed him outside the Dole office. Uh, seen as kind of dealt with in the film, but that made him a national figure, really. I mean, after that, there was all the outrage about why he had two houses or why he was getting the Dole and all that. And, uh, you know, there were questions asked in Parliament. and So he was a notorious figure, so everybody had some story about him. Cahill seems to me to be an essentially Irish character. He had no truck with authority whatsoever. Um, is, is, is this a, an Irish characteristic? Absolutely, and I mean, he didn't even have any truck with the authority of subversives. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> he was subverting the subversives in different ways. He, 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 no, he didn't. In fact, you know, I, he was rejected by everybody in society, so he rejected everybody. It was a nice little turnaround. Uh, <laughs> and he was a dangerous man, there's no question about it. And. Um, you know, there, there is a very unsettling, kind of disquieting uh, feeling. Uh, that program that was done in 1987 was, was quite unsettling. Uh, but no, he had, had, he had no deference or reverence for anybody, really. Can also featured John Maybury's Love is the Devil, telling of the turbulent affair between Francis Bacon and his muse and lover George Dyer, with Derek Jacobi remarkable as the artist. 
Did you know Francis Bacon personally? No, I'm one of the few people who didn't. <laughs> I've met so many people who had Francis Bacon stories. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I wasn't um, a heavy drinker in those days. Well, they, they, they did a very good makeup job because, in fact, you don't look at all like Francis Bacon. I'm sure you're delighted to hear that. But <laughs> yes. I mean, in, in the screen, you didn't. Yes, he didn't do my confidence that much good when. Um, uh, because he wasn't a great looker, no. Francis Bacon, and uh, with a few swift strokes, I looked like him within seconds, um, which uh, didn't do my uh, ego very much good. But uh, no, it was the hair mainly, I think. They dyed the hair and, and uh, that strange uh, style he wore and then uh, rounded the eyes. And somehow those chipmunk pouches appeared, <laughs> you know? And I think it's the way John shot it, too. Yeah. Um, um, never my, my best angle. <laughs> Yes, no, ah, that doesn't fill you with confidence either, no, does it? There were lots of shots with light bulbs and door handles, you know, which helped the effect. And who might you be? Well, you're not much of a burglar, are you? Take your clothes off. Come to bed and you can have whatever you want. You're already whipping up a fair amount of controversy with this, aren't you? Did you expect that? Um, I think it was inevitable, you know, um, particularly with the, the art world and the, the kind of art establishment. There's, um, you know, there, there's a certain sense of ownership that people feel about Bacon and his legacy. And so inevitably you're treading on people's toes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I knew that there was going to be a, a degree of uh, animosity from certain quarters, but that's never really bothered me actually, that kind of uh, I like whipping up a bit of controversy if I can. Okay, so the film's all done and made, and then you're invited down here to take part in a set our regard. Did, did that surprise you? No, I mean, I knew when we were working on the film that we were making something special. Everybody, the entire crew, worked unbelievably hard you know we had no money the budget was tiny um, so people certainly weren't doing it for the money you know they were doing it because they believed in the project and and I knew as it as it went on that we were making something very very special and that it would have an audience beyond the kind of the normal confines of, of low budget sort of English cinema um, but it's incredibly flattering to be um, invited to Cannes Every year, the festival gets bigger and more hectic, but plus au change, plus c'est la même chose. As Bill Pullman pointed out, it continues to present those uniquely canned moments, along with the usual razzmatazz and madness, or to strike a bilingual note again, la folie encore une fois. <laughs> People would say, well, you're going to have a can moment at some point, you know, some, something will happen to you there that will never happen to you any other place in any other festival. Yesterday, being so, you know, kind of out of it when the bellboy came and standing naked and trying to talk to him and re not realizing he's speaking French, I had totally lost track of where I was. <laughs> and we had the worst conversation. I realized I had my T-shirt over my crotch the whole time. No wonder he... We didn't do too well. This year's closing film was Godzilla, not itself a work of art, I fancy, though the ubiquitous hype surrounding it almost amounted to an art form. Yeah, well, that's probably bragging, but he's certainly taller than the Carlton Hotel. Of course, nobody took Godzilla seriously, but Martin Scorsese and his fellow judges were much impressed by Ken Loach's My Name is Joe, the moving and very funny story of a recovering alcoholic who coaches the worst football team in Glasgow. Those Glasgow accents were a bit of a problem, though. Even the British critics were sometimes obliged to read the French subtitles to discover what was going on. To that? Yeah. So are they still on the go? No, uh, my dad died 14 months ago. And my mum died when I was a teenager. Of course, I get that. Do you get any family? Me? No. None? Aye, aye. She's okay, I can get a family. She's got a family. <laughs> I don't know what. Hey? Might see a photograph? Yeah. Big family I've got. Old boys. There we are. Sunday best. <laughs> <laughs> 
My God, the gym team. It's a very enjoyable film, Ken, but you don't make films just for entertainment, do you? There's more to it than a love story or a comedy. Yes, well, I mean, it, we wanted to make a film that was very personal and private, but also, you know, after you'd seen seen it, left you with a few thoughts about the way the world is and, and in a way, the way um, circumstances intervene in, in what could be a very, a very, very good relationship, but but the world intervenes you know, and breaks people up and then possibly brings them together again. You've got a very good um, leading actors in Peter Mullen and Louise Goodall. You like working with people you know, don't you? I've, I'd worked with Peter in Ripra and he was a very sharp, funny guy in that. And uh, I made a little note of some, some time we must try and work together again. And Louise was in Carla's song in the small cast, and they they were um, to work with. They they were a joy because they really hit it off very quickly. Well, cheers. I don't drink, sir. Well, why don't you say? I'm an alcoholic. Mm. How long have you been off? About ten months. Nearly a year. Right. Need any help? I'm in the Mm. I'm too nosy now. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, it's good. It's fine. I like it. You're direct. Don't mess about. The only complaint I've heard about the film really is that people can't always understand what you're all mm. saying. Mm. But um. Well, what do you do? You know, it's set in Glasgow. You can't. You can't talk any other way. So. Well, you couldn't have had a bunch of people from Rada, could That's you? That's right. <laughs> they couldn't be doing your RP. No, definitely not. <laughs> So they'll just need to grin and be. <laughs> At this moment, you are among the favourites for, for the acting prize here. Uh, so are, you, are, you, are you sticking around or are you, will you come back if you win? The, the mob that organise all this are in a, something of a dilemma because I don't fly. Um, really? No, I came down by train. And it I've done that once. It's, it's much, it's much more enjoyable. Beautiful. Actually. Yeah. I, I loved it. It's 18 hours from yeah. Glasgow, all, all in. So they are there in this quandary. I am in no quandary. I go home. I'm happy just to go home. The, the, the prize stuff, you know, like any of these things, excellent. If someone says there's a wee prize, lovely. And if they don't, hey, Jesus, I got to do a Ken Loach film. I'm a happy chappy. I, yeah. don't, I don't need the headmaster to give me the bloody prize to make me you know, feel good about it, you know. So it's good that way. I mean, there was a prize last night and they're all, you know, and yeah. they applauded the bloody prize. <laughs> you know, it's, it's only, I mean, thou shalt not worship false gods, in, but except in can, you know, there you go. That's Clock this mob. Right. We're on the same strip as us. Yeah. Yeah. Referee, yeah. man, how come yeah. they've told us this? Yeah. Yeah. Referee! We always play in West, we always, we always West Germany. You lot should not organise a bloody yeah. pig night. Yeah. Hey, Mojo! Mojo, get the back there. Fury rating, get a shot, sir. They play in red and black. What's that? The rules are against their home team. All right, all right, all right. We'll get a shot, sir. Okay, we'll get a shot, sir. All right, all right. Happy France, Becky. Bye, Fury. Thank you. 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 There was a rumour going around that the only reason you actually came to Cannes was to try to get tickets that's for the Brazil Scotland match. That's absolutely true. That's God's truth, yes. Well, how um, are you doing? Because we, we can't get tickets for love nor money. Um, it's all been divided up for business and all this stuff. And I'm seriously hoping to meet some very nice, rich French person that will say, I enjoy your film, they have two tickets. And I'm, I'm <laughs> off. Ken got a present of a World Cup final ticket. Did he really? Yep. And he came running up to us like a little 12 year old and said, nee, 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 nee. He's not going to give it to you. No chance. <laughs> but the thing is, because he, he said, at least we might be there. That's what he said. Ooh. Ooh. That's the English for you. <laughs> <laughs> Invitations to less exclusive events than the World Cup present a different problem. Now, here's a quandary. As you can tell, I've been invited to a cocktail party. Actually, I was invited to six cocktail parties, all hosted by film companies and all held at exactly the same time. Well, I chose to come to this one, but you see how hard life can be at Cannes. All the time, decisions, decisions. Meanwhile, the alternative festival at the Hotel du Cap was pleased to welcome those well-known producers Hugh Grant and Liz Hurley.
What are you here for then? I mean, it's lovely to see you, but what are you here for? <laughs> we're giving a big party to all our international distributors, most of which are Polygram. Um, domestically, it's being um, distributed by Warner Brothers. So those deals were both in place before we started shooting. So there are, there are a few territories. They just made a Japanese deal, which you know has no um, definite distribution from any studio. No, um, but no, it's really just talking to the distributors, chatting them up, being very nice to them, and saying be particularly nice to our film. And you know, we want a lot of screens in your territory. That sort of talk, which and is my favourite sort of talk. <laughs> that happens. Mickey Blue Eyes. Yes. Yes. Now th this is an American film. Well, well, it's it American money. It's a hybrid, really. It's American money and uh, produced by two English people, me and Elizabeth, mm. directed by a Canadian with a very English sense of humour, like Canadians tend to have. And I think the film's got a very English sense of humour, actually. But it is set in New York, so I don't know what the heck it is. But what do you play in it? I am auctioneer Englishman in a company like Sotheby's, except less successful, who falls in love with a girl from Queens and uh, everything's fantastic except it turns out her dad's a mobster and I get drawn into this mob world and it's a sort of weird fish out of water clash of worlds kind of romantic comedy. And when do you start on that? Because you're kind of busy at the moment, aren't you? I, we've shot this one, we've shot Mickey Blue Eyes, it's now being edited. Oh, yeah, splendid. In our offices in London. So and, you uh, are here now drumming <laughs> up interest that's among right, chatting up the exhibitors. Yeah, and that's right. And schmoozing and in and other words. Press, you yeah. especially. Of course. Yes. Um, for that, really, yeah, yeah. Mickey Blue Eyes. In town, producer Ray Fiennes beat the drum for his film, Onyegin. It is your first time at Cannes, isn't it? Yeah, it's my first time. That's amazing. I, I actually, I was asked, some pressure, pressure was put on me last year to come here to, to help raise the finance for Onyegin. And I felt something, I felt quite odd about coming to promote something before it was done. It didn't yeah. feel right. I, thought that, um, I don't know why, anyway. Um, but I feel that now I have shot the film and it is starting to... We're starting editing this week, and um, we have sold it in some territories, but one or two well, key, key key territories are the U.S. So I want to help help it find a, a distributor there. So you're, you're hustling and bustling and wheeling and dealing and all those things. Well, I think my producers are doing most of that. I'm sort of trotted out as a sort of mascot. <laughs> yeah, I, well, yes, because uh, to be frank, I don't see you as a hardline no, salesman. No, I'm or not. I once we had to sell shirts. For a day along the um, Edgware Road and up into Kilburn, I needed, a ho I needed a holiday job. And we were given a bag of trendy shirts to go into shops and sell them to the people working in shops and offices. I think I sold about two shirts in the whole day. Well, I hope you're better mm. at selling your own movie. <laughs> slightly nerve-wracking to be here in competition, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I'm, this, the film was a, a particularly difficult film to make. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. So to be at this point with my actors here and to be in the sun and to only have to do a lot of interviews, believe me, <laughs> it's not bad at all. And if we win nothing at all, we'll leave so happy and so proud. It's really, honestly, it's, it's just, it's fine. <laughs> It's not a problem. Well, the, the character you you play, the um, leading man's wife, um, in other words. The wife. The, the wife, handbag. The, the ha no, wife, she's the much more than that. Well, she's not. Yeah, she's much more than that. But you, when you read it, mm -hmm. you didn't you didn't didn't think you were right for the part, did you? No. Why not? Um, well, mo I have to say, most things you cast, um, and your physicality is a major decision maker. You know. And I wasn't looking particularly um, Mandy-esque at that time. <laughs> and I, um, but I read it and I, I was fixated. I mean, it's the best thing I've ever read. And it was the best job I've ever had. And I had the best time I've ever had at work. And I've made a lot of good, really good friends. And it's still like, I watched it last week in New York, finally complete, you know. And I was drenched, I was bawling my eyes out. It's, it is such an amazing film. It's about one thing, but it encompasses so much more. And I really, I haven't seen a film like this before. I'm excited about it. I think it's amazing. You're not, you're not in the publicity department. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm in the heart-to-heart -heart department. Honestly, I love it. Now, your two main stars, Ewan McGregor and uh, Jonathan rhys Myers, am I right in believing that they would like to be pop stars? I mean, Ewan McGregor particularly. Oh, man. He, he, both of them. 
both of them. I, who wouldn't? <laughs> Let's just start there. Okay. I mean, who wouldn't? It's just the people who are already on stage and, and having people applaud and scream for them can probably imagine it a little more than you or I can. How might that scenario, purely hypothetically, appeal to you at this juncture? What Jerry's trying to say is, do you want to come to London to cut a record? Oh, yeah, cool. What do you need? Everything. See, Harold was my main man. Uh, but now I'm on the methadone and I'm getting my act together. And you come here and say you want to help. And I say, hey, far out. You could be my main man. It was pretty clear what was happening. It happens every day. But for the world to think it was happening, well, that was Jerry's particular genius. So can we look forward to the two of them going on tour soon? Oh, man. <laughs> I, nothing would make me happier, believe me. It's, it's really, uh, it was a thrill. You go along as the roadie. Oh, any day. I'll be the major groupie on the, on the, on the tour. Now, where, if indeed anywhere, would you expect to find a partnership involving Mick Jagger, legendary rock and roll icon, and Tom Stoppard, one of the world's most eminent playwrights? The answer, of course, is here in Cannes, where they are, metaphorically speaking, in bed together for a film version of Robert Harris's novel, Enigma. Tom writing, Mick producing, and both of them schmoozing like mad with potential foreign buyers. But this is going to be your debut as a producer, Mick, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Why? I mean, wh why did you suddenly well, decide to do I this? I don't know, really. <laughs> why does anyone... St <laughs> you know, one falls into things in life, you know, you never really know. I mean, I'm, I admire people that know exactly what they're going to do in life. I never really have, so I just... Well, you fell into being a rock legend, I fell into you? being a rock legend, <laughs> yeah. So I fell into that. I did, actually. And then I fell into this, so I'm quite happy there. Are, are you going to be a, a real hands-on producer, sort of hanging around the set and... I don't think taking the names best producers bucks. saw us hang around the set too much. No, I, well, they probably don't. No. <laughs> no. Well, I've been pretty hands-on so far with, um, with you know, getting, well, getting it from the stage of being just an idea and, and then, uh, yeah. you know, from the idea of doing it to having a script and, a, you know, getting the money and the cast and working with Tom, yeah. you know, I think we've done three drafts now with Tom Stoppard and, you know, it's, it's, everyone was afraid of Tom. Because he's so fantastically well, he, bright. And, yeah, well, he is a bit bright. Isn't and he's very bright, and people are afraid of his intellect, and they don't want to tell him that, wait a minute, we need a much bigger ending. <laughs> but anyway, so I was sort of feeling like I didn't mind to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's true. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think he made the right kind of noises and then had to invent sort of a rather large climax, which isn't quite in the book. Oh. But Robert Harris approves, I have to say. The author of the book likes it. Oh, good. Yes, it's all right. how, do you, how do you feel about having everybody terrified of your intellect? Um, well, it's news to me, I and mean, you're not terrified of it. I no, well, I've known you long the time. obvious. <laughs> well, maybe that's the trick. Um, no, I mean, the thing is that, that um, writers occupy a very peculiar position in the movies, because before, before you're on board and they would like you to write it, they treat you as though you're a very frightening intellect and something of a genius, and you have to be treated with kid gloves. The moment you've done the first draft, you're exactly like a schoolboy handing in his homework to the headmaster. You stand there and you're sort of thinking, oh, all right, sir, I'll do that and I'll do that to it. And I've, done, I've written Enigma three times, but it gets better. So what were the final bits you were doing down here? Was that getting the, extra, the, the final bits of the money? Or yeah, what? I'm talking yeah. about the casting too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you because all the players, well, no, no, I, I don't, I can't do it. Because I guess I hate doing, you know, in movies, they always announce everything before they've yeah. done it. We don't do that in music, so I hate that. It's all very hush-hush, the cast, isn't it, at the moment? It's enigmatic as is the it? I'm glad itself. you said that. I was about to tell you everything. Oh, I God, I should, I should um, keep my mouth shut. But the process is, uh, is really quite interesting because uh, you, you have to sell it in order to make it. But mm. um, somehow you can't sell it without almost having put the whole thing together so you can make it. And it's almost like watching the light go out in the fridge. You can't really hire anybody until it's sold, and they won't buy it until you've hired them. It's, it's, it's so, Catch-22, actually. It's, it's it? quantum yeah. mechanics. <laughs> now here's a rare sight, Bruce Willis strutting his stuff in Cannes. Mostly he grants audiences at the Hotel du Cap, where he's plugging his uncompleted disaster movie Armageddon, 50 minutes of which were shown in town 
to whet the appetites, or maybe not, of an audience of us hacks. That was an interesting experience yesterday, that 50 minute show reel you showed, because it was part extended trailer and part yeah. sneak preview. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's, I think it's a little bit of both. It's a, I've never, I've never uh, been involved with a film where, they, where they've done that, where they've shown a 50 minute commercial for the for a film. No, I've never heard of it's it. It's interesting, no. But you must have been disconcerted when they started laughing during your big emotional scene. Well, not really. Um, if you take any film and you chop it up like that and you put scenes that, that don't necessarily follow one uh, as they would in the film, uh, it's it's taken out of context. Can is a, com you know, it's about commerce. It's not about entertainment. Uh, and uh, as such, I mean, that, that's why they showed a, f I mean, I would have much rather had them show a five minute trailer. Would make more sense, film. wouldn't it? Well, I don't think the thing you guys saw yesterday made much sense. You could take any any film, any you could take take the you know the Godfather, and chop it up like that, and move scenes around, and you know people would laugh at inappropriate times. Uh, it's, it's about commerce, not about entertainment. How do you mean about not about entertainment? Because I mean movies are about entertainment, aren't they? Well, movies are. Yeah, if you saw the film, and 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 we were sitting here talking about. You know, people laughing at inappropriate times, we'd have a problem. But this can is about commerce. It's about selling movies and making deals and advertising films and letting the world know that we have a film called Armageddon that's out there. And as such, I, I, I think it accomplishes you know, its purpose. So, finally to the prize giving, and yes, Peter Mullen was back to collect his trinket. I wonder if he's thought of swapping it for Ken Loach's World Cup ticket. Uh, Peter Mullen, Don, my name is Joe, Ken Loach. The la mise en scène is to John Borman for the general. A well-deserved prize, too, for John Borman. Twenty-eight years ago, I, I went to live in Ireland, where I've lived ever since, and uh, this week, the Irish nation voted for peace, and we're all very thrilled about that. The founder of l'unanimité to l'éternité et un jour, the Theo Angelopoulos. And the big one, the palm d'or goes to Theo Angelopoulos. No need, I think, to beware of that happy Greek bearing his gift. On the whole, it's been a quieter festival than usual this year, short on excitement and outrage, though reasonably long on interest. Some very decent films have been shown in competition, and if rather too many of them veered towards the view that life wasn't really all that marvellous, well, so be it. As Bill Pullman said, we all have our magic can moment, and mine came at the end of the 50-minute showreel for Bruce Willis's Armageddon, when a deeply emotional and tearful scene between an amazingly brave Willis and his screen daughter Liv Tyler so moved the entire audience that it fell about in helpless mirth. So much for the hubris of those who seek to hijack the Cannes Film Festival for their own purely commercial ends. Goodbye. Magic moments, memories we've been sharing. The telephone call that tied up the line for hours and hours. The Saturday dance that got up the nerve to send you some flowers. Magic moments, memories we've been sharing. Magic moments filled with love. So we bring them here. To be like lambs to the slaughter! I wish to report a disease outbreak. This is a process occurring in Amanda Tucker. Drunk! We can't win! Are we in danger?
The true story of a black GI who overcame racism in the US Army and went on to become a national baseball hero is told in the late film here on BBC One. The court martial of Jackie Robinson is in 50 minutes.